welcome. It's great to have you here. Today I wanted to talk about one of my favorite topics, something I've spent a lot of time doing these past 40 years, which is meditation. And this is not going to be so much a conversation about how. There's plenty of opportunities to do that. You can dive into the practice and guided sessions on a couple of my apps and platforms. Moreover, this is a really a kind of a far-ranging conversation about why. A little bit about the reach of meditation. Like many things that become popular or are seen as important or become ubiquitous, something that we can find anywhere in our society, it very often happens in conjunction with a kind of reductionism that goes along with it. Meditation has been around basically forever, uh, for a super long time. And it's really clear that throughout the ages, many styles of meditation in meditation practices evolved. In the last 20, 30 years or so, particularly in the last 10 though, there's been a lot of research that's come forward that validates certainly the physiology and the, cog the physiological and cognitive benefits of meditating. Just recently, I was listening to a, a rather popular podcast and the host covered the topic of meditation, but did so from a neurological standpoint. And I must say, I listened to it a second time and made notes, notes that I would incorporate into my teaching, et cetera because neurology is not my specialty. Um, I certainly have felt the benefits of meditation. I've seen students benefit from it. Um, but what I would say is that I was, little, I was left wanting by the end of this conversation from this neurologist as it relates to the, uh, the benefits of meditating. And again, super informative. But really, it was a kind of a depiction of the ground of meditation from a very physiological standpoint. So I wanted to have this far-ranging conversation with you, and uh, I hope it's interesting enough that you'll stick around for the duration of it. And uh, kind of some key landmarks that I thought would be meaningful is to, one, talk about meditation in light of a couple of important landmarks. One is um, the human condition. The other is, and it's part of that actually, is living purposefully, living with fulfillment, as it were, becoming the best version of yourself. And that's where I think really meditation, if we understand it properly as a methodology, begins to really become more meaningful, you know, as it relates to actually the deeper meaning and purpose of living. And then finally, I thought I'd touch on something a little more topical, which is um, psychedelics. And uh, I think they all help to shed light on this more 360 degree view of meditation in general. So let's jump into it, shall we? So it is clear, the evidence tells us that the evidence-based research tells us that meditation does impact us. In fact, it changes the brain. They've found, for instance, the. Um, 13 minutes of meditation, just 13 minutes a day, can improve um, our attention, our memory, can help us regulate our moods. Furthermore, we find that if you meditate consistently, it begins to elevate or enhance certain parts of the brain, namely the prefrontal cortex. And I'm being very general. I, I, I gave you my waiver beforehand that I'm not a neurologist. But what we do see is that what starts to come online in, in the brain is, a, uh, is the capacity to become more adaptive. In other words, we can begin to have, and the brain can be utilized in such a way that one, the amygdala uh, actually shrinks in consistent meditators. And amygdala, you might know, is the part of the brain, most, most primitive, that is really the formation, is really where uh, our anger and fear originates from as it relates into the brain. And then in terms of mood regulation and behavioral regulation, prefrontal cortex is what comes online in meditators and is actually further developed and enhanced. So this is all, this has all been proven clinically and they have the MRIs and 
to prove it. And we also see it in terms of the quality of life that reported by, purported by regular meditators. We get sick less. Those who meditate have a heightened immune system, immune function. And again, I, I, I don't want to confine this conversation to the physiology of it. Let's just say there's plenty of research. This is something you could Google and in, in, within 10, 15 minutes have so much more information that you might need. But still, that might not be enough for you to do it. I don't know if those numbers about the physiological benefits are necessarily what will inspire you to do it. So what I want to do is have a larger conversation. And let's begin here. Human condition. Let's begin with the end in mind. And without trying to sound alarmist, um, we're all going to die. And not only is that the inevitable outcome of having a life, but we also, anyone who's lived even five to ten years, has come to the realization that we don't always get what we want, and in fact, sometimes what we have and we love will be taken away. And people... The people that we love are also uh, as fragile as we are. We can lose them. They can get sick. We can lose our stuff. We don't always get what we want. But I want to hold to this death idea because what it suggests, and the yoga tradition is very forward, uh, fa- forward facing on this, and that is that it's the ever, it's the presence of death that. Uh, that means, in effect, that throughout each moment of our lives, that presence, that shadow, affects us moment to moment to moment. It's this, perhaps not conscious recognition, but even subconscious recognition or acknowledgement of the peril that we are all in at any given moment in our life. Again, it's something we want to either reject or don't bother really formally reject or just become unconscious about, but we are all facing the inevitability of our impermanence, and therefore there is fear that accompanies us at every step in the way. And now, that fear is in part informed by the fact that we see around us other human beings perish. We see things come and go. We're dealing with our own fragility in a world of impermanence, but it also is informed by something even, well, let's just say it's part of the human condition as well, which is that we interact with the world through the five senses. So what we see, hear, taste, touch, smell, the five senses, did I cover them all? Hear, taste, touch, smell. Uh, Yeah, I think I covered them all, did I? And we do that, and yet the antenna of our senses are really super confined, super limited. For example, what I mean by that is you and I see, there's both visible and invisible light. You and I see what the latest research tells us is we actually perceive of, this, of these two spheres of visible and invisible light, there's a totality of light that we're not seeing, again, Perhaps it's invisible, but but there is visible light that we actually don't perceive as well, that maybe an eagle can perceive or a bat can perceive. Far beyond us, we only perceive about 0.03% of reality, of the material world. That's not to say anything about the immaterial world. Just the material world, you and I are not perceiving 99% 0.97% of the world. And we can factor that same kind of confinement or limitation into all of our senses. The animals, for example, human beings perhaps have the worst and least attuned or sensitive sense of smell. You know, your dog is somewhere incredible now. They're finding that dogs, if trained, can actually smell cancer. They can smell COVID. So somewhere the number is to, and it's not, again, I've I've done some research on this, and there's no set, uh, no single number given for the sensitivity factors of dogs, but it's somewhere between 1,000 and 100,000 times more potent, more capable than human beings. 
The point I want to make is that you and I perceive a fraction of existence. And yet, we make all of our decisions, all of our determinations about ourselves, of the world, and our friends, and relationship, and news, and our journey through this temporary existence called our lives, based on really limited information, small, tiny fraction of information, and also, as it exists and is sorted through and processed by our persona, our conditioned mind, conditioned by our education, conditioned by our social, economic condition we grow up in, by the country we grow up in, by the time, within the confines of the time that we grow in. And you and I, again, leaning into neurology, we are hardwired into these things like confirmation bias, which essentially tells us, no, we don't actually see things as they are. We see things as we are through the lens of our conditioning, through the lens of our perception. There is confirmation bias, recency bias, negativity bias. And we're hardwired to look to others and others' opinions of the world to confirm our own confirmation bias. So we don't really see very much. So there's this body informing the value of meditation. First, let's begin with this idea of the confinement of our perception and our experience of life through that confinement. I hope that helps at least to set the stage. And now, let's talk a little bit about psychedelics. Again, a lot of really interesting research now has uh, kind of come to the fore. It's kind of the rebirth of of uh, the research around the benefits, perhaps, as it relates to psychedelics. And I think it's fair to say uh, the research is really pointing to profound effects as it relates to those who've experienced trauma, those with addiction, or those with clinical depression. There can be significant, if not lasting, change for those using psychedelics. There seems to be, and now I'm going to generalize, but somehow stepping beyond normative perception and then being able to come back. By the way, I'm neither a drug user. I've not used any drugs or alcohol for more than 35 years. I have no intention of doing it, and I'm not suggesting it as a replacement to meditation, nor am I in any way suggesting that you don't that you look beyond it, if in, if, particularly if you are in one of these populations suffering from trauma or chronic depression or addiction. Within clinical settings, there is a lot to be said for the value of, those, of the practice, I would say. At least that's what the research is saying. Another conversation we could have, I'm not going to go there today, which is some of the confusion that seems to be uh, conflating or... Um, meshing up, it's kind of a mashup between this idea that somehow they are equivalent, like the stages of meditation and the elevated stages or experiences that one gains in using hallucinogenics are one and the same. I'm not going to say that, so I want to just be explicit about it. Although there is some interesting intersection, and that intersection that I want to point out today has everything to do with it would seem in these therapeutic settings, for example, uh, end of life, where there is necessarily, where there is, it's common that there's either depression or deep anxiety or fear or anger, that when administered, again, clinically and with supervision, that one can come out of that experience and see the scope of life differently and see the prospect of death, one's own walking into the void, one's own physical annihilation, annihilation of our ego, annihilation of our persona, and see it differently. And by the way, many years ago, one of the most meaningful uh, meditation sessions I ever taught was actually to a woman who was facing the end of her life, and I was asked to come in and guide her in a meditation practice, someone who had never meditated before. 
And uh, the short version of it, I write about it in my book, The Four Desires. She came out of that practice changed. And her family reached out to me again, and I saw her one more time before she passed. But that there was such a dramatic shift in how she felt and how she interacted with those around her. So in both instances, I want to suggest, because I gave her, or the meditation practice that I provided her, allowed her to glimpse something other than this, than herself as her body, as it will. And the meditation practice, which we could, again, speak about more at another time, provided her the opportunity to know or to have a sense that she was indeed something more than her body. So there's some interesting correlation there for me, and I think it begins to, again, shed additional light on the value of meditation beyond just its physiological benefits. What is the benefit of beginning to objectify or see the confinement of our normal way of perceiving? One of the things that is commonly described in, in the psychedelic experience is this idea of leaping, of kind of taking a quantum leap beyond seeing ourselves as this persona, which you and I remain identified with. We are this set of realities. So I'm a father, I'm a teacher, a writer, I'm a lecturer. I live in a particular place. I'm male, I'm white, I'm this age. All of these vary what feel like absolute crystalline structures around which we then interact with the world. We have beliefs, we have desires, we have ideas about right and wrong, and they seem right because they seem like mine. And then if there's an opportunity, another might be the conversation around near-death experiences. Again, you read the evidence on that and people come back, generally speaking, prepared to live differently, having glimpsed something beyond normative perception. The Rod Stryker Podcast is in part sponsored by Sanctuary, my meditation, yoga nidra, and deep sleep app. With its easy-to-use interface and hundreds of audio tracks, upon downloading the app and becoming a subscriber, you will, within minutes, be able to find the ideal practice for whatever you need, healing, peace, empowerment, or a spiritual experience, you'll be able to find the right practice for you, no matter your level, and no matter how much time you might have. Also, I'm super pleased to be able to announce that we're now doing what I think is maybe the ultimate BOGO program. When you become a subscriber, you'll be able to give a subscription free to a teenager, a young person who could benefit from these practices. Just think about the difference you could make in a young person's life. We know that these practices do make a difference. My hope is that you will not just practice more, but give the gift of practice to someone you care about. Let's talk a little bit more now about what is this process of meditation? You know, Mindfulness is a practice that we hear so much about, but we also know that there are other practices. Some, for example, mantra practice, and then there's practices where we bring attention to a specific part of the body, say the third eye center or the heart center. There's meditation on the breath. I've done, um, in, in my teaching, what I've tried to do is attempt to, to collate, if you will, to categorize all those practices so we could begin to understand that one, not all meditation practices lead to the same place. And while mantra practice is taught by TM, but even more so over the last 20, 30, year, 30 years or more, um, mindfulness practice has become ubiquitous and kind of the practice of the day. But I will say that not all meditations lead to the same place. And that's an important thing to know, particularly when you want to begin to dial in to the practice that could be the most meaningful for you. And again, I want to have a subsequent conversation around that. 
to different types of meditation. But in short, what I can do is just begin to paint this picture of four fundamental categories that all meditation practice can be fitted into. And again, this will be beneficial whether you are looking to find the ideal practice for yourself or you're a clinician or a counselor or a meditation teacher. And you want to be able to provide the particular practice that'll be the most meaningful for a particular student, practitioner, environment, or as the conditions in life or the world change, it may well be that other practices are more meaningful. So let's just first look at these four categories and then just take a really uh, a relatively short, condensed look at the modalities themselves. So I can coalesce this or break all of the meditation down meditation practices that I've seen throughout the world into four fundamental categories. And the first one has to do with calming the mind. And by calming, I mean somehow giving the mind an opportunity to become less distracted and to begin to coalesce itself and enter into a state of ease. That in itself is already somewhat life-changing. Um, the mind is by nature always moving. It's distracted. And by the way, part of it, that's part of its function. It's how it keeps us safe in the world. It's constantly orienting itself in time and space. Is the environment safe? Is any particular sound I hear at any given moment meaningful? Is it safe? Is it unsafe? What are the implications of what I'm hearing, seeing, sensing, smelling, touching? And part of the man, part of the mind's job in that we'll always remember is to keep us safe. So when I begin to collect my attention and the mind enters into a rhythm of calm, something deeper than that preoccupation with safety begins to be experienced by the mind. We begin to, in a way, create the opportunity to see that there is something beyond mind, beyond this configuration of ego and body and persona and possession. So the first general one is calming. And that calming will have, will be conceivably already deeply beneficial by virtue of the fact that the mind now becomes more organized. And through the calming of a distracted mind, we begin to, as I said, observe or have the experience that we are more than the mind's preoccupations. There's interesting things that happen in that process of making the mind. So is that uh, making the mind calmer, if you will, more collected? In the process of that happening, invariably what happens, and I think if you've done meditation even once, you will vouch for this, that you find out when you meditate just how distracted you are. So that's an interesting thing, and it can actually be discouraging and which is that you start to try and focus on your breath, for example, and you notice much the opposite happens is you can focus on everything but your breath. And the very act of trying to focus your mind reveals how unfocused you are. So two things happen. One is you have a pretty unsatisfying experience or you begin to use that as a mirror, a kind of way of reflecting about your own mind. If nothing else, if you stick with it, so if you get discouraged and it's frustrating, you, you'll either stop or somehow you will begin to collect the resources to make your mind more calm. To collect your mind and concentrate it. By the way, that's the first stage of meditation, noticing the mind is distracted, bringing it back to an object of attention, be it your breath, a mantra, your own thoughts, for example. But the benefit of doing that is if nothing else, you realize how little time you spend in the moment, how little time you are present. So two things are happening. One is I'm learning to become more present, but by in the process of doing that, I, I'm learning, I'm gaining insight about my own mind. And part of that insight, very fundamental piece, is I see how distracted my mind normally is 
And this gives rise to something quite extraordinary, I believe, which is you have the opportunity to become more compassionate to yourself. And, the, and for me, that realization goes something like this. And it happened very early in my meditation life and continues to this day, 40 years later. Oh, no wonder life's hard. I'm rarely present for it. No wonder I'm struggling. I'm not in the moment. I mean, this kind of fantasy of the past, all shaped by, as I've already said, negativity bias, self-critical thinking, Recency bias, confirmation bias. And so what's it like if I become more present? If I, for lack of a better word, surrender? So there's this possibility that meditation very early on begins to help you move toward a greater level of self-acceptance. So in the process of collecting your thoughts, some other things begin to happen, which is rather than perceiving the world through a fragmented mind, you begin to see it through a calm mind. And there's this great metaphor that the Buddha taught when he was asked, um, oh, different, different story I'm thinking of. I need to find the right story. The right story is this, and this, you see this metaphor again and again, and the Buddha actually does reference it, but it's classic in the yogic and Vedic teaching, which is the idea of one moon and 10,000 moons, which it does come from the Buddha. And he describes the mind like the surface of a still lake. We see that metaphor about the lake and the mind consistently. So it has many levels, to, layers to this teaching. But in short, what it speaks to is the idea that when you see the reflection of the moon in a disturbed lake, you see many fragments of a moon. In fact, you don't know if you're seeing one. You may be actually seeing thousands of moons. As opposed to when the lake is still, you see one moon. You even see its phase, and you see it accurately. And so that is, a dis that is a powerful and very apt description of our minds. When the mind is distracted, when the mind is disturbed, when there's um, restlessness in it, it distorts reality. And when the mind is calm, we come to see things clearly. So that's the first stage. And there's many, even different approaches to m mantra, for example. Not all of them emphasize the stillness component and the calming component. But let's just lean into that as the first category. The second I would offer is the practice of meditation as a tool of insight. And this would very much come into, not entirely encompassed within mindfulness practices, but this is where we begin to inquire into the nature of mind itself, into the nature of what we think. You may or may not be familiar with this idea that if you're meditating, in the first stage, for example, trying to collect your thoughts, concentrate, that when your mind wanders, you recognize it's wandered, you bring it back to the object. The object could be your breath or whatever, a symbol, a feeling, a center in your body, a flame. You may have heard this saying then that when the mind wanders from the object of meditation, you simply bring it back. That's great, good. But in the second category, meditation more, there's some deeper reflection that has to happen in conjunction with that, in which we are observing where the mind is going. And we're beginning to reflect on the nature or the patterns of those wanderings of the mind. I had this client um, who was an extremely successful banking consultant, one of the most successful in the world. And when I got, when I first met him, he was one of the most distracted human beings I've ever met in my life. And he had all sorts of, a rather, you know, extraordinary cascade of cognitive challenges and stress issues and all sorts of things. I mean, he's super successful at what he did, but I began to teach him and over time began to work with him very regularly. And as his, over time, I don't know if it was the year, second year, third year into it, somewhere in there, 
he came, he opened his eyes after a practice and he said something to me I remember to this day, and it was probably almost 30 years ago. And he said, you know, Rod, when I meditate with you, so that's interesting because he couldn't quite get to the same place on his own. That's another issue. He said, I find answers to questions I haven't yet asked. I find answers to questions I haven't yet asked. It's as if something really quite extraordinary was happening. Remember the second category is insight. So what happens is as the mind becomes more quiet, again, the techniques will change depending on the emphasis of which of these four categories we want to go to. This is the level of insight. Something happens as the mind becomes more quiet. There's an organizational principle. We begin to discover that behind what is the mind, and I'm putting now the mind in quotes, Behind, beyond our rational mind, our intellect, our conditioned thinking, there is something, for lack of a better word, that's called awareness. Awareness is independent of conditioning. Awareness, for example, my experience of being aware is fundamentally drawing upon the same resource that has, and that has not changed since the very first day I meditated. And meditation and awareness is a is what allows us to have what we call metacognition, which is the recognition, the metacognition. Now we become aware of our minds. By the way, that is not complicated to become more aware or to have metacognition. If I asked you now, or if we had the opportunity, and I could lead you through a meditation, the first thing I would do is have you sit comfortably or even lie down. Preferably sit with your spine tall, your eyes closed, top of your head over the base of your spine. And then shortly thereafter, I would probably ask you to close your eyes. And upon closing your eyes, I might ask you to become aware of your body. Within a few seconds, just by virtue of you closing your eyes, it begins to elevate alpha waves, alpha brain waves. And the result is you become more conscious. Now, whether it's geared toward your, the space inside of you, you might become more aware of some sensations in your body. You might become, if we're focused outside, you might become aware of sounds that were in the environment that you weren't aware of previously. Closing your eyes increases awareness. And whether it's interoception or interoception or exteroception, outward or inward, we become more conscious. And we begin to be drawn, almost like a magnet, I would say, I would offer. We begin to be drawn toward that part of us that remains forever free from the mind, independent of the mind, and yet capable of seeing the mind as just another object. You know what I mean by that, right? I look out into the world, I see a lot of objects. I see my desk in front of me, I see the device I'm looking into in order to speak to you. I perceive these things on my ears, headphones and the microphone. All of these are objects. You're looking and encountering me along with however you might be listening or seeing me as an object. But rarely do I experience myself as an object or rarely do you experience yourself as an object. We are in this kind of Mm, anchored in and confined to this subjective awareness. So what this second stage of meditation does, again, there are various ways into it, various means will elevate it, and there are various times in our life where this becomes particularly meaningful. What it affords us is the ability to gain insight into our own being. How am I showing up? Simply, am I sitting tall? Am I paying attention to what's in front of me in the moment? Am I reacting in the best way possible in any given moment? That level of insight gives me greater sense of freedom, choice. Second category of meditation then is what I'm describing in general as the level of insight, practices that elevate insight. The third is harder to describe, but you know there are, there are categories within the great canon of meditation that come from Tantra or Tibet or, or Tibetan Tantra or 
Vedic Tantra, or Hindu Tantra, if you want to call it that, Vedic meditations, mantra meditation. There's so many different Buddhist practices as well that include things like visualization, that include things like bringing attention to specific centers in the body that the explorers who develop meditation practices recorded in their experience. But part of what they recognized was by bringing attention to specific areas within the body or moving the mind or in, in, um, uh, inviting the mind to do a certain movement. So if it moves from one place to another, let's just say from the heart to the head, from the head to the heart, from the tip of the nose to the third eye center and up and down, that it began to elicit different qualities in the mind that were necessarily helpful, that accelerated the mind's growth, that produced pot potentially feelings of profound harmony and wellness. So that's a third category, and I, I ha I'm being relatively general about it because it's an area that is rich with methodology, with different techniques. But not all of those techniques are necessarily popular, have been popularized, and depending upon the particular quality of the mind or quality, we could even call it soul-like quality, that we want to elicit, or we could even describe it as divine qualities that we want to invoke, the methodology changes. So the third category in brief has to do with asking the mind to do, compelling the mind to move or to perform a certain activity that then necessarily has a profound effect on the mind and thereby allows you to reach beyond the mind. So you're not just reaching your mind, you're actually beginning to reach something beyond it. For instance, connecting to life force, the force that sustains you and I. And we could argue that your life force is closer to the essence of you, closer to the reality that we all live in, than our, intelligent, than our intellect is. So there's plenty of reasons that we step into this third modality, which in general is a process, we'll call it, of accelerating growth, evolution, awareness. And ultimately, it links us into a field beyond the field of awareness. So if awareness is the essence of mind, what is the essence of that essence? And that is consciousness. And in a way, then, that's the fourth category, which deals effectively with spiritual experience. That's right. Not all meditation practices emphasize spiritual experience. In fact, you could meditate very successfully, gain tremendous amount of benefits as it relates to calm and yet not necessarily access a direct linking, a direct experience of spirit. So there's a place for all of these practices. I promised that I would then go through these categories of practice and I'll do that a little more uh, briefly. In essence, we have concentration. We take a normative mind, we give it an object, a breath, a mantra, a chakra, whatever, a flame. We compel the mind to move, to, excuse me, to not move, but to stay with that object. And in the process, mind is getting quieter. Now, if we stay with that object long enough, and if we endeavor to stay with it, and at the same time relax our effort, what eventually starts to happen is that we merge in some way with the object. So I can look at the camera and I can see it. I can look at a friend or I can see them. I can hear someone I, but, or I can listen or I can listen and I can hear. In other words, it's an elevation of cognitive, of the cognitive experience. So that would be the second stage of meditation, where our 
attempt to concentrate and collect the mind becomes effortless. And that is actually is described as meditation. The third major stage is samadhi, where I merge with it, where there becomes no distinction between the object and me. Over the course of four decades, I've trained thousands of students and mentored hundreds of teachers worldwide and shared content that, simply put, changes lives. I wanted to ensure that you can easily find the best resource you need to help you thrive. RodStriker.com is the easiest place to access video classes, immersions, courses, and trainings. Among other things, you'll find my class and course platform, Union, which features more than 150 and counting of my Tantra Yoga Alchemy classes on video, as well as all the audio tracks from Sanctuary. And for those looking to teach, dive deep in a retreat with me live, or to train, rodstriker.com is your home to begin and to continue your journey. The third major stage is samadhi, where I merge with it, where there becomes no distinction between the object and me, where the subject-object boundary dissolves and I merge with it. Depending on the object, then, I begin to become imbued with its qualities. So if I'm, this may sound a little esoteric, but if I'm looking at a flame, I begin to, in this third stage of meditation, I begin to experience the inherent qualities of a flame. Now that would be different than, for instance, if I were to concentrate on the word love, if I were to concentrate on the word love and I reached absorption into it, maybe I become love. Maybe there's no difference between myself and the experience of love. And that would necessarily be different from the merging and the deep oneness that results when I become inculcated with the essence of a flame. Okay, we can go more into that at another time. The point is what's going to happen in all of these things, all of these modalities in a way, what they have in common is that we begin to reach a certain state or condition beyond this normative, the confines of normative thinking. And this is where it gets really interesting as far as I began the conversation where I said, you know, I raised the specter of death to introduce the value of meditation. And let's see if I can just kind of conclude this conversation in this kind of general area. So in the end, meditation doesn't just acquaint us with our own mind and temporarily give us, give us an alleviation of suffering that comes with human life in human form. It possibly allows us, it does, it affords us the opportunity, it brings us to this gateway of consciousness where we, as the mind becomes quieter, we naturally begin to move toward the experience of being more unified. It's kind of one of the essential meanings of the word yoga, by the way. It's a it's a linking to universality, to oneness. There's a word that's kind of the word of the day in some meditation and metaphysical environments, which is coherence, and it's being used in a particular way, but let's just speak about coherence in a more general way. Coherence is unified. Not only do I become, do I have an experience of being more unified by being more in the present, by my mind being less distracted, but it's as if I begin to cohere and link to the, perf the pervasive coherence of this world of which I am a part, this reality that I don't normally perceive through my five senses, that the can, this, this structure of mind and ego can never fully conceive of. And so as I move toward a greater sense of coherence, toward the experience of this greater reality of which I'm just a part, some interesting things happen. And what I would offer first is that there is the possibility 
not even a possibility. What I'm going to submit is the following idea. And that is that there is nothing in this universe that exists without a full, without the inherent knowledge to become the fullest version of itself. So I'll say it a little differently. I'll say it maybe a little more slowly. Because it's a vital point, one that I think can help enliven a sense of faith in oneself and even the universe, despite all of the madness we see in the world. This possibility is always present, which is, Everything in the universe has the knowledge within it, the intelligence, if you will, to become the fullest version of yourself. It's as true in an acorn. So an acorn has all of the intelligence to become an oak tree. Nothing has to be taught. Same with a sunflower seed to become a sunflower, fullest version of itself. A tiger embryo. All of the intelligence to become a tiger is there. And furthermore, each human being is born with this intelligence inherent in it to be the fullest version of itself, not just to grow up, not just to have the ability to divide cells, but the inherent way that it will experience the best version of itself through all of the dimensions of life. That knowledge is inherent in the thing. The Buddha taught as usual, he, he was a master of simplicity and clarity, that the essence of mind contains within it unconditional love and the light of pure knowledge. So that as we get quiet, what we get down, what we return to is our essential nature, love and the guiding intelligence of this universe. This is where meditation starts becoming profoundly meaningful. Yeah, I'm all for the idea of the neurology and the beautiful, all of the amazing research that's validating so many, the rationale for making the case for why it's beneficial. But these are the things that I'm now describing, and perhaps the scope of this conversation is beyond somewhat of the measurable. So yes, they deal with quality of life, but even beyond that, they deal with something else. To be the fullest version of ourselves, perhaps that is the most profound of all desires that human beings are born with. Y y we could go further, maybe in some spiritual mm, worlds, there's a, a kind of a spiritual orientation to, yes, we also want to be free while we're living in the world, unburdened while we're living in the world. But that is, part of that has to mean being the fullest version of yourself. That is this overwhelming drive. The fullest version of yourself, unfortunately, becomes obscured and I would say, the, I, I should say, the guiding intelligence to be the fullest version of yourself, it becomes obscured by a distracted, undisciplined, fragmented, troubled mind. And so the power of getting clear means not only do I begin to d recognize that my mind is distracted, I begin to have the opportunity perhaps to find the questions, the answers to questions I haven't yet asked. There is an organizing principle that sustains each of us. And by minimizing distraction, by directing the mind towards its source, we'll say initially the experience of awareness is one of those expressions, but beyond awareness is consciousness. Unifying principle, not just in my own field, individual field, but the field of which I am a part. In a sense, I think, again, I want to generalize just the anecdotal stuff about psychedelics is this is the experience people are having. At some level is this, the breath of vision changes and we encounter reality far beyond the confinement of our ego and our persona. We sense, again, this is the description, and why those who've had trauma, those with addiction, those who are facing the end of their life, who otherwise are rife with anxiety or depression. Why things change? 
because there's this direct interface to that which is beyond limitations. This is why meditation is as meaningful it is as it is. It also will, in a later conversation, be the basis for talking about some of the distinction between the psychedelics, the experience of psychedelics as it relates to the insights they provide and the actual ladder of meditation and what its last and most profound states offer. There's also an element of the mind itself as being conditioned, not just experiencing the end of that journey, perhaps, but the mind itself is being equipped to integrate life and life experience more fully in the process of meditating regularly. Lastly, I want to propose we consider something. What would, what would your day like? What would your day be like if you were to feel the touch, to feel touched by the certitude that you were okay. That despite your circumstances, despite the world, despite what is the barrage of information, so much of it disruptive, so much of it depicting a reality pervaded by anything but peace and equanimity. We see and we experience, and it's almost impossible to get away from the perception of life being absolutely a mess. Human beings making things so much more difficult. Rather than harmony, it feels like there's disharmony. So what if, though, that despite that, you could collect a vision of yourself and the universe that was inherently whole. That you, there was at least a part of you that could not be made better by any level of success. Nor are you diminished by any failings. And I'm not saying that should predominate or overwhelm all of the other considerations you have in your life. It shouldn't blind you. It shouldn't necessarily be the basis for bypassing the areas of you or your life that need improvement and insight and recognition. As I said, all of these four categories have their place in our life. But what if, what if, upon getting still, still enough, that you entered into the most intimate relationship with reality? Just you and it. And furthermore, that that relationship could then ultimately result in there being no distinction between reality and what we think of as us. That we were one in the same thing, being perfect as a Father in Heaven is perfect. What if that could happen? What if, what if through these methodologies, we could snap our fingers and somehow understand, have real understanding of this um, line of Shakespeare that I love from Hamlet. There are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. What if we could see it? What if we could move beyond our narrow view of reality and there understand or know there we could experience and know that we were whole might it change your choices? Might it change your stress levels? Might it change your points of view? I believe the answer to that question is a, is a yes. So that's a little bit about meditation. Why meditate? It's as if all of us, so whether it's we look at meditation as being a kind of what kind of coalesced. This was this arising out of the human condition. It's as if we know we're something more. So whether the sages who sought meditation and reflection and deep prayer and contemplation 
realized that they needed to devote something. They needed some type of organizing practice, methodology that would allow them to see that something more. Or indeed, what we find in so many cultures is the use of drugs. You know? It's as if we all know we're more. That there is a belonging and a connection. There's a web that all human beings, that all creatures have. We know it. And it's as if we want, not only we know it deep in our genetic, psychogenetic makeup, but we want to know it. We want to be with it. It is that longing that is the basis for meditation. This is really that longing that form these methodologies that we call uh, meditation. And so I'll close there. I invite you to practice consistently. Again, I've devoted a huge, significant part of my life to creating resources for you to do that. I'm not even going to say I hope. My prayer is that you, that part of this message about why meditate is something that you can connect with that makes sense to you. And whether you lean into practices at any given time that are more calming and, in a sense, just steadying the waters of the mind, steadying the lake of the mind, or practices that enhance the insight so you can begin to unravel minds such that you can make better choices with life. Or there are these unique set of methodologies that are deeply empowering to the mind that accelerate our growth and our understanding, connect us to, say, life force, the source of cognition, or beyond, and finally, purely spiritual practices, that you find the methodology that suits you, and that you engage it. And finally, last message, we have to do meditation consistently, again and again and again. We're reminded that in order for a practice to bear fruit, to be meaningful, in fact, for us to begin to shrink certain parts of the brain that are less than constructive, to elevate and enhance and activate certain parts of the brain that are far more adaptive and uh, generate, if you will, yes, more constructive, adaptive capacities, we have to be consistent. So find a method that suits you, that you like, that you can do, taught by someone who seems to share it in a vein that is authoritative and meaningful and easy for you to enter. Well, thank you for listening. Until next time, keep practicing and keep evolving and be kind. Thank you. And a very big thank you to David Starbear Avalos for the Rod Striker podcast theme.